Our next presentation is by Brian Reiser. Brian's worked with the NRC committee to develop the framework for K-12 science education, which guided the design of the next generation science standards and developing assessments for the next generation science standards, which provides guidelines for NGSS assessments. Brian has also worked with Achieve to provide feedback on the design of the NGSS and on tools that help states implement NGSS and is collaborating with several state initiatives to design and provide professional development for K-12 teachers to support them in realizing the reforms in NGSS in their classrooms. Tonight he's going to be talking about current storylines to support 3D learning. And just as an aside, before we get started, i got to say that uh, the teachers in my area have been working very closely with Brian's team, and this has really been some trans transformational uh, products uh, that, that are really driving us forward there. So um, please give a warm welcome to Brian Reiser. Thank you, James. I'll put this over here. I'm going to need it in a bit. So I want to talk about some work we've been doing with teachers uh, to help them take the vision of the framework and the vision of what's behind the next generation science standards and bring it into the classroom to make a difference in the lives of kids. One of the things that I think is kind of challenging when we first start to think about the, the shifts that we're trying to make in classrooms is this idea of science and engineering practices being a key part of what happens uh, when kids are engaging with science ideas. And just to give you a little bit of uh, insight into some of the um, conversations that went on in the framework committee, the choice of the word practices was not uncontentious and was not something that we made lightly. We probably spent multiple sessions, of course it's a group of professors, you know, of course they're gonna argue endlessly about stuff, right? Because that's like what we do for a living. But we, uh, we argued quite a bit to try and find the right way to frame what we meant by these three dimensions. We considered calling it uh, science process skills, science skills, inquiry skills, uh, and we ended up very deliberately calling it practices. And one of the reasons that we did, and one of the things we wanted to try and convey is this idea that a practice isn't just something like a skill that you learn to do when you need to do it. It's a way of engaging with the world that you, also, that you engage with a community in order to make sense of and accomplish goals in the world. A practice means that there's a group of us that share a common set of ideas about what we're gonna count as a value in our discipline, how we're gonna go about making progress, how we're gonna make decisions, how we're gonna talk to each other, and so on. There'll be variations, there'll be differences. But it's not just a set of skills like learning to focus a microscope or whatever. So this was very important to us. And if you read the language in the framework, you'll see some discussion of this issue about the choice of the word practices. Now, the bottom line is that means that if we get to a lesson and kids are, for example, using the practice of analyzing data or the practice of developing a model, and you walk over to the table of kids and you say, so like, what are you guys doing? Well, we're making a model. Why? Because it says at the top of the page here, I'm supposed to make a model. Okay, but like, what are you, why are you making a model? Because the teacher said so, okay? Then we lose, okay? That's not a practice. That's not what we want, okay? Um, that's treating it like a skill, okay? Making a data table for the sake of making a data table. One way to think about it, and, and a way that we sort of talked about it with teachers, is um, to think about this idea of sense-making around a purpose. We're trying to figure something out about the world. We're not just learning about what scientists have done. We're figuring something out. And usually, what we're trying to figure out, we try and articulate, and we call that in English a question. Something we're trying to figure out. Or if it's the case that we're trying to like, make a change in the world, we might call that a problem, and it becomes more of an engineering focus. But either way, there's got to be something that's driving the work that we're doing. And it's not just a question like, what are the molecules inside of water, 
or a question like, what is condensation? It's a question about the world, okay? Scientists don't say, today I'm going to investigate the scientific concept of whatever. Something cool happens, you realize you can't explain it, and then you do science, right? Or you're stuck on Mars and you have to do science in order to figure out how you're gonna survive, right? So this is how, this is the vision, okay? It's hard to put into words, it's hard to put into standards, but that's the vision, cool. So we don't want, for example, uh, kids doing experiments or designing experiments, which you might consider inquiry, because we said today you're gonna get to design an experiment. Oh, I know, we're gonna design an experiment to figure out what plants need to grow. And you can explore whether they need water or not. And you can also explore whether they need light or not. And you know what? I also have some soil here. And you can, you can try, you can make your own ex conditions. And you get to decide if you want to use soil on the seed and blah, 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 right? OK, how, how many times in elementary school do we do this set of activities, right? That's not, does, that's not what we mean by engaging in a practice. OK. So we've been working with teachers, trying to either take existing materials and think about how to tweak them, or existing materials that claim they're really cool and NGSSified, and, you know, but we need to sort of dig in and deconstruct them to figure out how to make sense of them to put them into practice in the classroom. And, go back for a second. Uh, we were working with a group of second grade teachers and we wanted to work on um, a unit to get them started. So they said, you know, we do a lot with plants, and so we want to do a unit on plants. So we said, okay, let's go over to NGSS. We'll pull out the performance expectation. Let's see what it says. It says 2 LS 2 1, plan and conduct an investigation to determine if plants need sunlight and water to grow. That's not what we want, right? Well, it's kind of what we want because that connects to an important idea about plants. And we do want them to be planning and conducting investigations. But I don't just want to, it doesn't mean, the standard doesn't mean that I should walk into the classroom and tell the kids, our mission is to do this thing, right? We want it to be a practice. We want the goal to emerge out of something, right? We might have to contrive it because we can't just let them go wherever they want. If they want to study dinosaurs and we have to teach them plants, we're going to have to figure out how to trick them into worrying about plants. So, the, so I want to share with you what, this, what the teachers came up with, with, with uh, in, in working with us as an example of a way to try and situate the combination of the practices and the DCIs, the disciplinary core ideas, and the cross-cutting concepts in what we call a storyline. So, the teacher brought in, this is a second grade classroom, the teacher brought in for decoration um, some of this uh, corn, because um, we were gonna decorate our classroom for Halloween and Thanksgiving. And, um, but something happened. Uh, the teacher left the decoration corn outside and it rained and it got wet. And she was very upset and she was apologizing to the kids that, you know, we were going to like decorate our classroom with this corn. Um, and, you know, the kids said, well, that's okay. We'll, you know, maybe we can do that next year or whatever. And, but they started to ask questions about it. And the teacher, of course, was nudging them to ask questions and to think about what will happen. And they had a discussion and they predicted what might happen. And I'll just read a couple of these. Uh, some kids thought it would get ruined. Some kids thought it would rot and get stinky. Um, some kids thought that the color in the different kernels of corn would run out in the water because water makes things stain, etc. And when they realized, though, that they had different ideas about what might happen, um, they decided, you know what? We could just actually like let this sit in the water for a while and see what happens to test our ideas, okay? Um, one of the kids, but it was a minority view, thought that it might actually, something might happen, it might actually grow. But it was like, this was not like a plant, it was like it, you bought it from Target, you know, right? It was like a decoration. 
So, so we decided as the class, or the teacher and her kids decided as a class to let it sit. And this is what happened after a while. Okay. Um, things are happening. So we took some careful observations, uh, the kids did, second graders, and a lot of interesting ideas started to come up about what's happening here. One of the first issues, one of the first controversies was, is this thing actually alive? Could it actually be alive, right? Because um, it kind of looks like, I mean, there's this green stuff coming out, and um, you can go to the website and see pictures close up if you want. There's this like white stringy stuff coming out of the bottom, like into the water. And each day it's getting like a little bit bigger. So the kids started to wonder about whether it's alive. And actually they started to use words like growing and so on. Um, and this set us off, or set the classroom off. I really want to be in the second grade classroom, so that's why I keep saying this set us off. Um, on a series of investigations. I, the teacher did not say we're going to plan an investigation. The teacher said, let's see what will happen. It turns out that um, first we did sort of a just watch and observe thing, but then because questions started arising, um, one of the key disagreements that happened is where, where were the green things coming out from? And there were two positions that emerged, and both, each, with, each of which with evidence. Some kids thought that the green shoots were coming out of the cob, the central part of the corn thingy. And other kids thought it was coming from the individual pieces of corn on the cob, right? Which we learned were called kernels. So, we decided, or the classroom decided, you know what we could do? We could take like just some of the kernels and put them in some soil, separate from the cob. And we could just take a piece of cob with no kernels and we could put it in the soil separate. And then we could see which one will grow. And the teacher says, yes, this is cool. This is, we're gonna, this is like what we're gonna start calling an experiment, right? And we're gonna keep certain things constant, we're gonna keep other things variable, et cetera, et cetera. So it turns out, if you follow the, the string of questions, we get to questions like structure function questions about the plant. It turns out, A, who knew, but corn is a plant, okay? <laughs> and, and B, um, the little, each kernel of corn that you eat is like a seed. It's like totally weird, okay? So, um, and then the kids started asking questions like, okay, now that we know that the kernels are the seeds, uh, what it, does it have like a giant little plant, a shrunken down plant inside the seed? What does it have that allows it to grow into, et cetera, et cetera? And so the questions just unfold, not randomly, not just from the kids, a lot of careful cultivation by the teacher to get the string of questions emerging. And sometimes it's sort of 80% the teacher nudging and 20% the kids co-constructing, sometimes it's 80% the kids, they demand what needs to happen next, and the teacher you know, says, you know, great. Um, but in all cases, the kids are not just being presented with, we're gonna do an experiment to figure out if the, if this, you know, when the plant needs light, does it need it when it's a seed, does it need it once it starts to, to be green, et cetera. And so, the, we call this, um, well the teachers that developed this, the th three ladies in Connecticut, they started calling themselves the ladies of the corn. Um, <laughs> we called this a storyline because it's kind of like the story of how we figured out what we figured out. And um, I won't talk through in the interest of time, uh, this is another example, um, but we, we do this with in middle school as well or in high school as well. Um, uh, in this case, the phenomenon was not like a surprise, kind of a fake thing like the teacher set up was just um, uh, an apparatus the teacher set up for us to experiment and play around with. Um, and uh, we discovered that um, it, you there's this plastic black 12 inch wide circle-y thing with grooves in it and you can put just like a plain old needle, sewing needle, and an apparatus that just sort of holds it in place and spin it and you can hear stuff. 
like it's not even plugged in. There's no hard drive or MP3 storage. It's totally weird. And so we play around with that and we get to some ideas about what it is that makes sound, but we got more questions than, than we do ideas. We start to think through investigating musical instruments that vibration has something to do with it. We basically spend a couple of weeks figuring out that vibrating things make sound and sound makes things vibrate, which it turns out is like way back in fourth grade. Um, but then we don't think that that could be true of, we think it might be true of musical instruments, but not things like a floor that you bang on because the floor can't vibrate, it's solid. Because we learned in first grade that, that solids are things that keep their shape and don't change shape, right? In order, and we also figured out in order to vibrate, because we modeled this very carefully, something has to deform in order to change shape without moving. That is, we, moving in place is what vibration is, right? So it works for a guitar string, it works for a drum head, uh, but it can't work for the floor. And so we do some experiments and find out that in fact, a table or a floor actually is secretly vibrating when it makes sound. And we go on from there and explore all kinds of questions about, so what makes louder or softer sounds or higher pitched or lower pitched? So the bottom line is, what we're trying to accomplish is, Working on a unit should be, from the kid's perspective, coherent. From the kid's perspective, we're putting together a bunch of puzzle pieces. First, we figured out this piece about the corn, that the seed is actually, the, the kernel's actually the seed. We still don't really understand how it grows, so now we're gonna take the thing apart and see what's inside of it, and then we're gonna figure out what it needs to grow once we discover what's actually inside of it, et cetera. And so where do we learn the disciplinary core idea? Lesson one, lesson five, lesson 12, yes, right? You're putting it together incrementally over time. And also from the kid's perspective, why are we doing what we're doing? We're gonna make a model because we disagreed about what was happening to the musical instruments when they were making sound. And so we wanna draw out like a cartoon, this was middle school kids, step by step, what happened when a vibrating instrument made sound and we do it for a drum head and we ask ourselves, is that model gonna work for a guitar string or a tuning fork? Let's see. And so we challenge ourselves and test the model against these other instruments and then we push it again, et cetera, et cetera. So why do we do today's experiment? Because we had a question or a gap in our model that we, were, we couldn't sleep at night and we came back in and we said, gotta do this, we gotta figure this out. We've got a couple examples you can look at. We're building more and more. We're trying to find pilot teachers. There are other labs or groups in the country kind of also working on the same approach. But um, regardless of whether you're developing your own stuff or, so, or you're trying to figure out how to take something into the classroom, thinking about how the pieces fit together, our feeling is and the feeling of the teachers working with us, that's a really key part of what you need to do. Thank you very much. Thank you.